This light board will provide you with an overview of CXR image quality and discuss the limitations associated with suboptimal images. So specifically, we'll be discussing the projection, the rotation, inspiration, as well as lung volumes, and then lastly, the penetration or the exposure of a film, as these are going to be your major contributors to image quality. It is important to note that the main factors that are actually going to influence or regulate image quality are going to be patient position or considerations, as well as radiographic technique. However, just be cautious not to very quickly dismiss a poor quality scan or request a repeat scan if the clinical question can still be answered. So firstly, we're going to start off with the standard projection of a chest x-ray. So the standard projection, as demonstrated on the image above, is going to be a posterior anterior projection. And the reason for this, as demonstrated on our image, is that you have an X-ray source, you have an X-ray beam, which is then going to penetrate um, your patient or particular structures, and then you're going to have a film detector, which is actually going to capture the wavelengths that are absorbed. So what this means in a PA, it is going to be referring to the directionality that a beam is passing through your patient. So specifically we're passing from a posterior aspect or the posterior part of the patient first and then passing through the anterior and then hitting the film detector. So in essence the anterior structures of the body or of your person are going to be the closest to the film detector. So this is gold standard because firstly you're going to see an increased quality of scan. Secondly, you're going to see less superimposition of the posterior structures. And then lastly, but most importantly, you're going to have a more accurate representation of the heart size as well as the mediastinal borders due to the fact that you have less magnification associated with these anterior structures. So you might be wondering then, well, why do we care? Why does it matter if it's AP versus PA? So as demonstrated on the image below then, this shows you the relations of the anterior and posterior aspects of the heart um, correlated to the detector as well as the field of um, view. So the image above represents an AP projection and I guess the most critical aspect is going to be um, looking at the size and the shape of the heart when we're referring to AP versus PA. So this is going to be most important when we're considering any pathology to the lung par parenchyma as well as the mediastinum itself. So as a rule of thumb, if you're looking at an AP view, you can see that the heart is actually going to be further away from the detector. As a result, it's going to be more magnified or enlarged. So you cannot assume that the heart is going to be enlarged on an AP due to pathology as this is just going to be a natural artifact or consequence of the scan. So as we can see on the AP, the X-ray beam is actually going to be more divergent, so this is resulting in the increased magnification, um, as the source is going to be closer to the patient. So what we can see on our AP view then is increased magnification. So it will present or suggest that the patient has cardiomegaly. However, this is actually just an artifact associated with the scan quality and not actually representative of pathology. Secondly, you can also see in terms of the contrast, um, the lung appearance is going to be a lot more dense and the, the borders are going to be a little bit harder to differentiate or distinguish. In contrast then, if we look at the PA projection, we can see that clearly the anterior structures, so the heart, the chest cavity, is going to be closest to the film receptor. As a result, you don't have as much of an influence of magnification. Um, magnification is going to be minimized. 
by using um, a narrower beam and this is then going to be produced by the fact that the x-ray source is going to be a further distance from the patient. As a result of this we know that the heart size then is going to be more accurate or representative of the size um, of the patient. And then thirdly, what do you do if the scan is unlabeled? I guess it's fair to assume that in the modern digital age that every scan will be denoted by an AP or a PA at the top of the radiograph or in the DICOM set. However, in the instance that you do come across an older scan that is unlabeled, it is fair to assume that it's going to be a PA radiograph based on patient position and um, technique convention. However, it's also important just to double check that this is the case. So for illustration purposes, I've included an AP and a PA radiograph below. These are courtesy of Radiology Masterclass and can be found at their website. And these are really great images because they actually give you an annotated version in terms of drawing or annotating um, the borders of particular structures. So I guess that the key take home structure that you need to assess when you're looking at an unlabeled radiograph is going to be the medial edges of the scapula. So firstly then, if you consider the AP projection down the bottom, so firstly, I'll show you the unannotated version. You can see that it is of a lower quality. So what I mean by this is the contrast is a little bit off. Um, it's also not as clear to delineate the borders of particular structures. And it's actually a little bit more blurry too due to the magnification. In this particular patient, as denoted on the radiograph itself, they have had a mobile x-ray conducted um, specifically a sitting x-ray from an antro-posterior perspective. If we consider then our main key anatomical feature, which is going to be the scapula, when tracing the medial border of the scapula, we can actually see that they are not retracted, so they're in the normal anatomical position of a patient sitting down. As a result, we can actually see superimposition of these medial borders on the lung par parenchyma. And then lastly, if we're looking at the heart, we can see that the heart is actually exaggerated in size due to increased magnification associated with the patient position. Um, and as a result, by measuring the cardiothoracic ratio, we can see that it is going to be roughly 50%, um, which is within the abnormal or the caution zone. So if we then do a repeat scan in a PA projection, um, we can see that automatically the quality of the scan is a lot higher, the contrast is more pristine. If we trace the medial borders of the scapula, you can clearly see that they are now out of the field of view. So um, the scapula have been protracted laterally. Um, as a result, the lungs can more easily be visualized or seen. This purely also has to do with the fact that when you position a patient for um, a chest radiograph, usually their arms will be around or hugging the detector, or alternatively, the patient will be asked to stand with their hands on their hips, naturally um, abducting the scapula itself. And then lastly, if we look at the heart borders, we can see that both left and right borders are now very easy to visualize, as well as the hemidiaphragms. There is um, no superimposition of particular structures or no concern areas of possible consolidation. And then also, if we measure the cardiothoracic ratio, we can see that it is going to be well under the 50% um, threshold, so indicative or, or ruling out no pathology in this individual.
So the three main contributing factors then to image quality and suspected pathology is going to be the rotation, inspiration, as well as penetration. So a really cool mnemonic to remember this by is going to be rest in peace or RIP. So firstly, R is going to denote the rotation, so making sure that there is no rotation associated with your patient when you're taking the scan. So a way that you can um, assess whether there is any rotation is by looking at two main anatomical processes. So firstly, the spinous processes of the thoracic vertebrae. as well as the medial aspects of the clavicle. So once you've located these particular structures on your chest radiograph, so as denoted by the blue illustration or superimposition, you want to make sure that the spinous processes of the thoracic vertebrae are lying within the mid-sagittal plane of the patient, as well as the medial ends of the clavicle should be equidistant of each other within the mid-sagittal plane. If neither of these structures correspond to the mid-sagittal plane or look like they are symmetrical to each other, this can then be indicative of rotation of the patient. So it's going to make it a lot more difficult to assess um, tracheal deviation, for instance. It's also going to make it a lot more difficult to assess the heart borders or contours, um, as well as the appearance of the lungs, as well as structures which are going to be fairly parasagittal, such as the hyla of the lungs and the major vessels stemming from this structure. So then the next thing we need to consider is going to be the respiratory phase of the patient. So the gold standard for a chest radiograph is going to be to have the patient breathe in and hold. And what this means is the patient should be in a full inspiration state. As a result, when we're looking at the inspiratory state, the anterior ends of ribs five through to seven should superimpose the diaphragm in the midclavicular plane. So if we can see or recognize in a patient that inspiration is incomplete, usually your telltale signs is going to see exaggeration of the lung markings. And in accordance, you'll also see an increased density associated with the lung parenchyma um, presenting as more hyperdense due to the fact that there is less air filling the lungs. So the image below shows you a typical um, CXR taken in an expired state. If we go through and count the ribs, we can see that it is the anterior aspect of the third rib in this instance that is intersecting the diaphragm in the midclavicular plane. So clearly we can see that this is not in accordance with our gold standard of ribs five through to seven, um, which is going to be representative of, of inspiration. So the way in which you can determine whether your patient is in an inspired or expired state is to start by counting the ribs. So the image below now actually shows us a repeat scan of this particular patient in a fully inspired state. As, as we can see, as we're counting the ribs through from one all the way down to the diaphragm, it is going to be the anterior aspect of the sixth rib that is actually intersecting the diaphragm, which is consistent with our standard once again. As you can also see um, on the inspired scan, all of your lung fields are clear, whereas with the expired diagram, there was a particular error in the left lung, which might have been suggestive of consolidation. So it's just important to note that the greatest clarity is going to be associated with the lungs being hypodense structures, so they're going to be filled with air upon inspiration. So the next thing we need to then consider in our fully inspired state is whether there is hyperinflation of the lungs. Often hyperinflation or overexpansion of the lungs can be associated with obstructive pulmonary disease, so it's important to rule this out. 
one of the first um, key signs of hyperinflation, if we stick with our counting the ribs technique, is to look at which rib is intersecting the diaphragm. So if you have ribs 8 to 12 intersecting the diaphragm, this usually means that there is going to be overinflation. And secondly, another telltale sign is going to be the shape of the hemidiaphragms. So the next radiograph below shows us the appearance of the hemidiaphragms in a normal inspired state. As we can see by the green lines, the diaphragm typically has this natural tent-like or dome-like appearance. The white lines on this image represent the length between the costophrenic as well as the cardiophrenic angles. And in a healthy individual, this should be greater than 1.5 centimeters. In contrast, if we look at an individual now which has um, hyperinflated lungs, we can see as denoted by the red lines that the shape of the diaphragms now have flattened. They're also a lot more inferior and the length is going to be less than 1.5 centimeters. In addition, associated with hyperinflation, we can see that the rib contours are actually a lot more difficult to visualize due to the fact that they are less dense. Um, this is also associated with um, steroids um, administered to this particular patient. We can also see that we have consolidation um, located at the base of each lungs, which is consistent with pneumonia. And then lastly, so the piece in our acronym or mnemonic is going to be penetration or exposure. So this is specifically referring to the degree at which the wavelengths are penetrating um, or being absorbed by particular structures. Although this isn't as much of an issue now with digital modern capabilities where you are able to adjust the window levels to make um, or to improve the contrast and the appearance of structures, this is more a cautionary note when you are looking at older more antiquated scans. So the first radiograph that I've presented below represents an overexposed or overpenetrated radiograph. So the key telltale signs is we cannot actually make out the contour of the left hemidiaphragm. So it's not going to be continuous um, or you cannot see the medial edge of it um, in relation to the spine. Um, also, we can actually see that we've lost the appearance or the contours of the heart and you cannot see any structures posterior to the heart, such as the vertebral bodies. So in contrast now, since it is a digital radiograph, we can then adjust the window levels to give us a more um, well exposed or well penetrated scan. So when you're um, adjusting the window levels associated with the scan, there are two main considerations that you need to take into consideration, which are going to be representative of a good quality image. So the first thing is the vertebrae or the vertebral bodies should be visible posterior to the heart. The second telltale point is going to be if you trace the left hemidiaphragm, you should be able to see the full shape of the diaphragm from the most lateral aspect um, of the costophrenic recesses up to the medial aspect where it is continuous with the spine. So this means that if you're looking at a well penetrated image and you have lost the ability to differentiate the contour of the left hemidiaphragm or you're unable to see the paravertebral soft tissues, this might be a key telltale sign or be suggestive of pathology associated with the mediastinum or with the lungs. So I think this then covers the main factors that you need to consider when we're assessing the image quality. So once you have or once you're able to assess image quality and you're in agreement that this is a great quality scan that you're able to answer your clinical question, I then want you to then go on to consider the ABCDE's um, Lightboard video which goes through how to examine using a systematic approach any pathology um, or abnormalities on radiographs.